Well, thank you very much for everybody showing up today. Um, I was struck, as I said in my opening impatience to start this, that that is a character of what I feel that we're, we're having happen around us, that there, there is a lot of impatience about going somewhere that we're not and trying to get there. Earlier today, it may have been, I think it was today, I received an article from a, a good friend, Kathy Diorio, talking about sea legs, about how we're really out on the ocean and this is fast, waves and these conditions where we really need to navigate and change our course and, and, and not be stuck on a fixed position. Most recently, we passed the point in three months worth of time on the coronavirus that more people have died in the three months than we lost in two decades of the Vietnam War. And, and it, to me, it's just, it shatters the, the scope of trying to put this thing into perspective. Well, the first thing that occurs to me is stop trying to put it into perspective. There is no perspective that can allow this to make any sense because we are at the whims of the divine nature of existence. This is the world communicating to us in the only way that it really knows how. Another good friend of mine used the way of describing attitude as a state of readiness. I love it when we share things and then we steal from one another. And if, you can, if we can up the quality of the people that we are listening to, we up the quality of the human experience. And this is what makes the myth salon so rich for me is that the people that have come into my life as a result of this have just enriched my existence beyond any sense of entitlement that I have. I, I, can, I can't tell you how grounding it is for me to feel that there is a way through this because I have a family, I have companionship, I have a sense of community. And so people are saying yes to us. People are saying yes, they wanna hear what we have to say. They wanna come here and share their story. And today in a few moments, Will is going to introduce John Booker. And we're gonna go forth and spend a couple hours involved with one another to try to process the things that are real for us in terms of the narrative of our time, the story that is being told, because it's being written as we speak. Every time we say something or come up to a new situation, it falls apart. And we keep trying to put it back together. And I'm gonna suggest, stop trying to put it back together. Let, let it just stay apart. Let it be what it's going to be and figure out how to deal with the eternal nature of change. And on that note, I wish I knew a story that would chase away your fears, give you courage to confront life's changes and get you there from here. Follow your imagination to the sky, to the sea, and wrap yourself in the depths of your own dreams. I was struck today by listening to Leonard Cohen, and I'd play it if I thought we could get away with it and everybody wanted to listen. The song is Everybody Knows. Everybody knows that the dice are loaded. 
Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows the war is over. Everybody knows the good guys lost. Everybody knows the fight was fixed. The poor get poor, the rich get rich. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that the boat is leaking. Everybody knows that the captain lied. Everybody's got this broken feeling like their father or their dog just died. And everybody knows that the plague is coming. And everybody knows that it's moving fast. Everybody knows that the naked women are just a shining artifact of the past. Everybody knows that the scene is dead, but there's going to be a meter on your bed that will disclose what everybody knows. So I'd like to hand this over now to my good friend, Will Lynn, with whom the Myth Salon has been a co-endeavor of ours for the last four years and for the last couple months during this pandemic. I'm so proud to be associated with him and so proud the first time I approached him with doing this that he said yes. He's a beautiful man. I'm more beautiful as a result of knowing him. And I thank all of you for being here with me today. Will? Thank you for that warm introduction, Dana. I hope you know I feel the same way. Um, this, is, this has been, uh, I, I like to think of the Egyptian golden flower, the Egyptian golden lotus. Uh, the, the actual flower blossoms and then drops its petals. And then the next day, the next petals. And the next day, the next petals. And I love it because it's, it's endlessly flowering. It, there is another flower under the next one, under the next one, under the next one. And uh, anything that can be described that way is, is a beautiful thing. And I certainly feel that way about the Myth Salon. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've consistently talked about now that we're doing this uh, online virtual adventure, uh, one of my missions just eventually somehow somewhere uh, became wanting to help the field of mythology the community of mythology participate is a more connected community than than we have in the past and that means uh you know there are sub communities in mythology these linguists over here these hollywood storytellers over there these esoteric scholars in this place these mystics it's religious studies etc cetera, etc cetera. and i've always wanted to support and cultivate a dynamic relationship between those communities. I think we have a lot to share. And I think that now is the right moment to really push forward with that vision and, and hope. And uh, I'm moved to see in the group, uh, everybody, people that are from uh, studio school, filmmakers, from the Joseph Campbell Foundation, from all kinds of different territories and, um, and dimensions of the field of mythology. And that's, that's exactly what we're hoping for and really great to see. And um, when I introduce John in a moment, uh, what, I, what I really hope comes through is that, you know, originally I asked John, because John can kind of cover most topics in the field of mythology. So originally I asked him if he would go in a direction that we hadn't particularly done just to help us continue to stretch the drum. But ultimately that, that was uh, not nearly as valuable as letting John just personify and represent a fully stretched drum on his own. Uh, he's, he's somebody that comes with a number of backgrounds. Uh, he's uh, friends in the audience here from his publisher at Michael Weesey, which publishes the, the top books for uh, screenwriting and film. Uh, and I hope you'll check out his book, Masters of the Cinematic Universe. Thank you to, to Michael Weesey for helping to share this event. Uh, they're friends from the Joseph Campbell Foundation, the audience. Uh, thank you to them uh, for being supportive and participating here tonight too. And John, as you'll see, uh, is somebody, is a rare mythologist who represents what I hope we can all strive to be as mythologists, which are uh, uh, people that see how this applies and participates in our world today, people that can bring together a numerous interdisciplinary fields and bring them to bear on the current situation from a psychological and mythological point of view. So uh, really in for a treat to have a representative of that capability, maybe, maybe one of the best uh, with us tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, our panel and our group. Of course, you've just heard from Dana White, who's uh, a producer and contributing faculty at Pacifica, and he's the co-founder and host of this Myth Salon. Uh, as a co-host, uh, I chair a general education department at Studio School, which 
I'll take a moment to say we were just named a top 50 uh, film school worldwide by Variety this week. We're very proud of that. Um, and I'm, I'm also a contributing member of the Joseph Campbell Foundation team and do a number of other things. Uh, Dennis Slattery is an author, scholar, and faculty member at Pacifica. Uh, Dr. Zaman Stanizai, Stanizai is an author, scholar, and faculty member at Pacifica as well. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Nelson, uh, also an author, scholar, and faculty member at Pacifica. Voris Nunley is an author, scholar, and professor at the University of California, Riverside. And Dr. Selena Matthews is an author and clinical depth psychologist. So wonderful to have this expansive group, some of us with backgrounds in literature and psychology uh, and mysticism and religion uh, to, in philosophy. Uh, so I, I hope that we are um, modeling uh, this vision of an inter interconnected, uh, co-related uh, Sangha of mythologists. And now uh, let me introduce John uh, officially, formally, and he'll, he'll take us in for the night. Before I do, let me just uh, tell everybody what our agenda is going to be. John is going to go for about 20, uh, a little bit, maybe a little bit longer, um, minutes or so, 20 minutes or so, and then I will um, respond. And when I do, this will signal for the rest of the panel to get involved. Um, and then we'll make sure that we have at least half an hour for questions afterwards. So at any time that you have a question uh, that you wanna make sure you have a chance to ask, what you should do is you should click panelist, and then you should click raise hand. And those are the questions that we'll really try our best to get to. We'll also try to respond to the Q and A's and the chats, but realistically we're unable to manage all three of those uh, streams of information at once. So. Uh, please prioritize clicking participants and raise hand and we'll bring you into the discussion with the last half hour. And with no further ado, allow me to introduce John Booker, who is the author of six books, including Master of the Cinematic Universe, Storytelling for Virtual Reality, A Best Practice Guide for Sex and Storytelling, and Storytelling by the Numbers. John is a wry, influential, energetic, captivating man, a raconteur in the truest sense of the word, uh, with a deep uh, following in the creative sectors of the film, television, and production worlds. He is animated, brilliant, and not surprisingly funny at the right age in his own life to take full advantage of both the digital explosion of media development and the tragic conditions created by the pandemic that has driven us all into the sacred spaces of our own homes. John Booker is a master craftsman of story making, storytelling, and story construction, part guide, part psychic traveler. Uh, he cooks the elements of Campbell's hero's journey until they burst with clarity and precision. The Miss Salon will become a cauldron where he can stir up the perfect storm with tales and techniques. He's worked for HBO, DC Comics, and Warner Brothers, and he currently serves as a content creator, curator for the Joseph Campbell Foundation, and he teaches writing and story courses at the Los Angeles Film Study Center uh, and When We're Lucky Studio School. Uh, thank you, John. So looking forward to what you have for us tonight. Thank you, Will. I'm uh, going to go ahead and share my screen just to get the technical part of this out of the way, and then we can get underway here. Okay, is everyone seeing the screen okay? I am, yes. Uh, and uh, welcome everybody to the next step in our technological journey with this Myth Salon, our first screen share PowerPoint. Hope this <laughs> goes well, and if it doesn't, it's, it's all on us. Well, thank you again, Will. I, I would like to just thank a couple of the organizations that have been really supportive of me and my work. Uh, as Will mentioned, uh, Michael and Ken from uh, uh, Michael Weesey Productions that published my uh, first book. I, I'm so thankful uh, for them and I know they're here tonight. Um, I, I wanna thank uh, the, the faculty and staff of Pacifica Graduate Institute and especially the Pacifica Alumni Association. Uh, again, so many there have been so supportive of me. And finally, uh, I, I want to thank the Joseph Campbell Foundation. Uh, Bob Walter, in particular, has just been so, um, so supportive of uh, me and my work. And much of what you'll hear tonight has come through uh, the, the work that I've done with these organizations. 
Um, and last but not least, I, I want to thank Dana and Will uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, I deeply appreciate the invite. It's, it's good uh, in difficult times to come and to be with your people, your tribe. Um, plus, it gave me my first excuse in weeks to put on pants, which I'm proud to say that I'm wearing tonight uh, for the first time in a long time. So um, that, that is my gift to you. Friends, we find ourselves in the midst of great misfortune tonight. And whenever I find myself in the circumstances of great misfortune, I, I often recall a favorite story about others that have found themselves in similar circumstances. And I'd like to share with you a, a story that comes from Jewish folklore, and it goes like this. Whenever misfortune threatened the Jewish people, Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov would retreat to the forest. He would light the fire. He would say the prayer, and the misfortune would be avoided. Now, in the passing of time, this task fell to a second rabbi who knew both the place in the forest and the prayer, but not how to light the fire. Nevertheless, the misfortune was avoided. A third rabbi knew only the place. The prayer and the fire had both been forgotten. But this, too, was enough, and the misfortune was avoided. Finally, the task fell to Rabbi Israel of Razin, who knew neither the place, nor the fire, nor the prayer. All he could do was tell the story, and somehow it was sufficient. In the midst of our great misfortune, I certainly don't have all the answers, or I don't know the right prayer, or where in the forest we should light the fire, but I do know the story. And maybe, just maybe, these stories that we remember together, our myths, just might be enough. Earlier this year, our, our world was completely stopped by invisible forces. That which we were unable to see changed nearly everything we had come to believe about our lives, our safety, and what we thought was our right to normality. It was all completely different before any of us could really even understand what had happened. Every person that we knew was affected. We've seen stability, employment, and even our very health placed on the bargaining table of the unknown. And now we've entered this time of masks, a time of returning home. What could be more mythic? I fear in this season, though, that some of us, we've, we've become like the shades that Odysseus met in the underworld, crying out for news of the people up above, but unable to really feel anything ourselves. These social gatherings in this online space, they, they offer us something. But like many of you, I, I long to be out in the world, hearing the news of what others have been creating with their lives. I, I long to wrap my arms around other human beings and celebrate the experience we have together called life. I long to sit around coffee tables and at bars and look face to face and eye to eye with other souls who I can share stories and ponder the deeper meaning of what all this means together. My thoughts the last month or two have really been swimming around three ideas. And I'd like to take the time uh, over the next few minutes to share some thoughts about each of those with you. I, I've been thinking a lot lately about time, about home, and about technology. I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about time, because specifically, I've been thinking about one of my favorite comic book heroes, a character named Eden Fezzi, who's also known as Manifold. It's one of uh, Marvel's X-Men. Uh, and Fezzi is an Aboriginal Australian mutant, and his power is the ability to bend time. And in one particular story, uh, referred to often in comic culture as the final incursion, his character uses his powers to help save humanity from the end of the world, but Fezzi's killed in the process. In other words, human beings are saved in the midst of great tragedy, but time is lost as a result. 
something about that narrative speaks deeply to me. Like Fezzi in the, the final incursion, I feel all at once a sense of great opportunity and a sense of great loss. As much as I've tried to bend time to my will during this time of COVID-19, days keep blending together. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday have become blurs day for me. I, in, in some ways, I feel as though I should have more time than ever. In other days, I, I feel like the day is over moments after it starts. So many projects that I, I plan to get done when I have the time, they remain untouched. And I, I guessed that having the time wasn't necessarily the problem at all. So I have to ask myself, what actually was the problem, if not time? The relationship between time and loneliness has become really profound to me during this season. I mean, we're all capable of being without others for bursts of time, but where is that threshold? How much can we sustain collectively? Few myths involve only a single character, and even the ones that do usually have other characters eventually join the narrative. We need others to make sense of our world. So I keep asking, what is it with time? There are, of course, numerous mythical connections to time. Joseph Campbell, whose words so often seem to transcend the time he spoke them in, had a lot to say about time. There's a, a video clip right now on the Joseph Campbell Foundation's Instagram account that I, I wish you would go and watch. You should be following them on Instagram. And this particular clip that they have up right now, um, it, it's wonderful. I'm going to read to you Campbell's words, but it's not the same as hearing Campbell say those words. There's something that's transmitted in the way that he presents this idea. But, but Campbell says, where there is time, there is inevitably birth and death. Where there is time, there is inevitably sorrow, the loss of what was valued. And it's always in terms of pairs of opposites. In the field of time, everything is experienced in terms of opposites, good and evil, male and female, man and God. That's a mode of experience. We see Campbell's words ring true of numerous stories, myths, both in times past and in time's present. In Frank Baum's collection of American fairy tales, he crafts this story that's become really interesting to me lately called The Capture of Father Time. It's a story about this kid named Jim, who's the son of a cowboy that lives on the broad plains of Arizona. His father uh, had taught him to lasso and all these other great cowboy skills that any boy should know. And when Jim's 12 years old, his father takes him to the east, to the big city, to visit his uncle. And Jim, of course, brings his lasso, anxious to show off his skills to his cousins, who they get bored with it rather quickly. But Jim manages to find a horse, a vehicle that he imagines can take him to a, a place of happiness and enjoyment. And he wanders outside the city on horseback, enjoying the open space that he begins practicing his lasso in. Suddenly, as he's throwing the lasso into the air, the rope catches on something, and to Jim's surprise, he looks up and sees that he's caught Father Time. Now, Father Time is none too happy about being caught and demands to be let go, angry that the boy's antics have brought everything to a standstill on Earth, not unlike our own coronavirus. Jim asks Father Time how he managed to catch him, and Time growls and says he doesn't know, he's never been caught before. He tells the boy that he guesses it was because the boy was foolishly throwing his lasso at nothing. Interesting how time stops when we foolishly throw our lasso at nothing. The boy challenges time that he just didn't see him. And time fires back that he's invisible to the human eye unless they get within three feet of him, which he always takes care to maintain. It's the original social distancing and the story goes on to tell us of the antics that the boy plays on the city folks while time has stopped and the world becomes a dreary place with time at a standstill. And life becomes unpleasant for everyone, including Jim, who in the end recognizes that he had completely forgotten about the horse that brought him out of the city where he could enjoy his lasso. So as Campbell told us earlier, where there is time, there is inevitably sorrow. But as myth suggests, where there is no time, there's also sorrow. 
We're stuck with sorrow either way. We strive against problems in the midst of the coronavirus, just as we struggled with problems before coronavirus. And spoiler alert, we'll probably struggle with more problems after the last of the social distancing bans have been lifted. Whatever time brings us will offer sorrow and joy, laughter, love, pain, as it always has and it always will. The next thing that has really been capturing my attention during this time is this idea of home. The virus has returned us all home. Rollo May says in The Cry for Myth that the presence of a home is essential to any myth. Perhaps we all need to return home, to be brought back home. Perhaps we've been called back home. Yes, physically, but has our calling back home been about something more? something greater than just where we physically eat and play and sleep? Are we being called back home in some other sense, I'm wondering? Something in us longs for home. We've written stories and sang songs about home since the beginning. I mean, we, we make film after film and TV show after TV show about characters just trying to get back home. The Grateful Dead said it's a long, long way to go home. Jay-Z said he was always at home. Simon and Garfunkel saying, home is where my love lies silently for me. From Mumford and Sons to Metallica, from Billie Eilish to Burl Ives, they all sing about home. And it speaks to us in this native tongue we could never fully articulate with words. But who or what is leading us home? Are we being dragged home? Did we rejoice at being able to return home or did we return home like prodigal sons and daughters? Wherein does our motivation lie? What will we be led by while at home? What will lead us forward? Leadership seems in such short supply right now. It's so often enshrined in our political preferences or simply who or what makes us feel safe, but perhaps we need something more something greater to lead us. I've been wondering if what we really are searching for is a piemander, a word that you might be unfamiliar with. It means shepherd. Perhaps we're looking for the shepherd that has taken on a thousand faces, a piemander. In the divine piemander of Hermes Trismegistus, which was for the scholars and academics in the house, an endeavor to systemize and elucidate the corpus hermeticum, it says the following. The Supreme Lord of all, who has walked and talked with the worthy ones of every period since the dawn of time, is the very same Lord under whatever name he has invoked. Whenever and wherever he is said to appear, he is known as Adonai, as the Christ, as Osiris, as Krishna. But it was as the divine Pymander that he appeared to Hermes Trismegistus. We see a world desperately searching for some sort of piemander right now. Some have looked to Dr. Fauci and some the president, others a news organization that aligns with their politics. But perhaps one of our greatest errors in searching for this piemander among the individual egos that make up our leadership in every corner of society. It's easy to get lost in the metaphor of the shepherd. We struggle against any narrative where we're discussed as sheep, understandably so. But if we can look past that, the symbol of the piemander has so much to offer us. See, a shepherd not only herds their flock and moves them toward food and water, a shepherd can see above the flock with a clear line of sight. A shepherd has the ability to see ahead and guide the flock away from problems. A shepherd can also take their staff and correct these move, those moving towards unseen danger. What are we allowing to shepherd us? during this time at home? Our fears, our uncertainty? Where is that centering place that you go to? Have you found it in this season of home? These Zoom meetings are, are bringing a new meaning to the term glass houses. I, I love them, but we're seeing people in their home environment more than we ever have before. And I'm always fascinated by what the background is and someone's Zoom in, image. And, it's amazing to me to hear so many of the same people that complain for years about having to go to work now pine for the days when they can go back to their office again. 
I, I've been thinking about this old folk tale uh, called The Old Woman That Lived in the Vinegar Bottle. It's an English version of uh, the German story, The Fisherman and His Wife, for those of you who are familiar with that story. And in the story, this, this woman lives in a vinegar bottle and she's made her bed there, a kitchen, uh, all the common items we'd find in a unique little house. But the old woman spent much of her time complaining about where she lived, how stuffy it was, the smell of vinegar that never seemed to go away no matter how much she cleans. She, she longed for this country cottage with a stone path and a garden. It was her dream, that thing that would make her life so much better. So one day these two fairies are flying by and they overhear the old woman complaining and decide to grant her wish. They tell the woman to perform this little ritual before she goes to bed that night and then to see what she sees in the morning. So she performs the ritual and she goes to bed and the next morning, sure enough, the woman wakes up in this country cottage with a stone path and a garden. She is thrilled. She dances, she sings. She, she couldn't be more happy. But the one thing she fails to do is to thank the fairies. Now the fairies go east and west and north and south carrying on about their fairy business and doing whatever fairies do. And one day, one of the fairies wonders how the old woman is getting along. So they go and check in on her. And wouldn't you know it, the woman is complaining again. It's cramped in the cottage. The stone path is so plain. I should be living in a mansion on a hilltop with servants, chefs, maids. That is what would make my life better. And again, the fairies tell her to perform the ritual before bed and she'll have what she wishes. So she again performs the ritual and she is thrilled when she wakes up in this mansion full of servants. But again, she forgets to do one thing, to thank the fairies. Now this story goes on and on and the woman gets home after home, which delights her at first only to eventually bring her back to her complaints. And you can probably guess what happens. By the end of the story, the, the fairies eventually return her back to that old vinegar bottle, convinced that if she couldn't be content there, she wouldn't be content anywhere. But we have to ask, were we content before the coronavirus struck? Because we, we might struggle to find that contentment after everything goes back to normal. Comedian Pete Holmes, who's a huge fan of Joseph Campbell and often talks about Campbell's work on his podcast, he's got this wonderful anecdote about people going to Hawaii, not realizing that they're going to be the same miserable people in Hawaii as they were before they got on the plane. And if we're solely dependent on these circumstances to change us into different people, we may be very disappointed later. What are we doing right now to become the people we want to be once this all comes to an end? Finally, I'd like to turn our thoughts to technology. And the framework I'd like to use to do that is a trope of myth and fairy tale, the magic mirror. Probably best known for Disney's association in the film Snow White, uh, mirrors have had a controversial history in literature it's been argued by a number of feminist scholars that mirrors are often used against women in mythic narratives. And I don't think they're wrong, but I also don't think that's always the case either. For example, in Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber, mirrors play a key role in the development of the protagonists. And I, I really like uh, what scholar Stacy uh, Poston Connor at University of Tennessee has said about mirrors. And she builds on a, an idea that's very common among people that discuss myth. And, I like the way she articulates it though. She says, mirrors are liminal spaces in which transitions to new identities take place. Now, rather than use the magic mirror from Snow White or some of the more common fairy tales, I'd like to instead focus on a magic mirror from a Rhodesian story that comes from an African oral tradition. And it was captured by Andrew and Nora Lang in the Orange Fairy book in 1906. And it was a common story that was told among the Sina people. The hero is Gopani Kufa. And one day Gopani Kufa is out hunting and he encounters an antelope and a snake who have become ensnared while the snake was trying to eat the antelope and the antelope was trying to escape. Now Gopani Kufa isn't sure what to do, which one of these animals he should kill and which one he should let go. So he consults a wise wasp that he carries around with him, like you do. And the wasp tells him to save the snake 
and kill the antelope. Well, the antelope is appalled and tells him that this decision will eventually be his undoing. And the snake takes Gopani Kufa back to his homeland and takes the form of a human king. He tells Gopani Kufa that he can have anything in his entire kingdom as thanks for sparing his life. And Gopani Kufa, he spends a few days in the kingdom and he can't make up his mind what he wants. And again, he consults the wisdom of the, the wise wasp that he carries around. The wasp tells him to ask for the king's mirror because the mirror grants the wishes of the one who owns it. So he does just that. He goes to the king and he asks for the mirror and the king does not want to give up the mirror, but he eventually relents and Gopani Kufa returns home with the mirror and uses it to make his homeland wonderful. Eventually everything is made so wonderful through the power of this magic mirror that he gives the mirror to his daughter to place under her pillow for safekeeping because he just doesn't need it anymore. The story goes on in a group of white men, the first that Gupani Kufa has ever seen come into the land. They end up stealing the mirror and the Rhodesians would tell the story to explain why the power of the earth rests with white men because they still had the mirror. And while there's so many directions we could go in dissecting such a story from symbolism to slavery, I'd like to focus on the idea of the magic mirror holding power because I believe we've become a society where nearly every member of our society carries around a magic mirror in their pocket. Whether Apple or Android, we've never as human beings held as much power so casually, and we've never had so little idea what to do with it. Technology has become the tribal fire. We are now all gathered around as I tell you these stories. Don't get me wrong, I, I love technology, and I, I'm so thankful for the technology we have during this time. However, I, I'm worried that capitalism has become the only driving force behind the technology that we create. Myth has so much to say about technology, and if we had more time, we could go into that from Hephaestus's crafting of Talos to Icarus to the Chinese folktale of Yan Shi, the mechanical man that could walk and sing with perfect pitch. We could easily simply view our phones as amplified voyeurism on steroids, and there's certainly truth to that as well. Author uh, David Foster Wallace uh, had suggested that most voyeurism takes place around frame glass, and mirrors are no exception to that, neither are our phones. These mirrors that we hold in our hands, our phones, they're powerful. And even though they seem to only be projecting images in one direction, I would suggest that they have the power to reflect back to us who we really are. They have the power to reflect a very skewed image. They have the power to reflect someone we no longer recognize or perhaps someone that we never were. They also have the power to reflect who we could be. Max Frisch said that technology is the knack of so arranging the world that we don't experience it. I'm gonna say that again, because that's really good. Listen to that. Max Frisch said that technology is the knack of so arranging the world that we don't experience it. Back to our friend Rollo May, who said that it was the what of human existence rather than the how we are famished. And of course, my favorite thinker, Joseph Campbell, concluded that people weren't so much looking for the meaning of life as much as they were the experience of being alive. We may rebuff technology for a while after this. I believe we will create experiences and we will crave experiences, real experiences that go beyond what our greatest technologies can provide. In this time of quarantine, we've deeply come to understand the difference between existence and being alive. I don't wanna just exist. I wanna know what it is to truly live. I'd like to conclude my thoughts tonight by turning to the wisdom of the poets. I've heard so many people say that they're anxious to return to normal. I'm not. I, I'm not waiting on things to go back to normal. Instead, I'm waiting on a rebirth of wonder. So much was broken before. I'm longing for that which we've never seen, something new, something fresh that rekindles the wonder so many of us have lost. 
either through this experience or with the coronavirus or perhaps even long before, we, we've lost our wonder. We've lost that sense of wonder. And I'd like to wrap up tonight by reading you a selection from a poem called I Am Waiting by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I'd also like to dedicate this poem to um, Dennis Slattery, who's, who's with us tonight, uh, is someone who has encouraged me uh, to continue to pursue wonder. I am waiting. I am waiting for my case to come up, and I am waiting for a rebirth of wonder. And I'm waiting for someone to really discover America and wail. And I'm waiting for the discovery of a new symbolic Western frontier. And I'm waiting for the American eagle to really spread its wings and straighten up and fly right. And I'm waiting for the age of anxiety to drop dead. And I'm waiting for the war to be fought, which will make the world safe for anarchy. And I'm waiting for the final withering away of all governments. And I'm waiting perpetually for a rebirth of wonder. I'm waiting for my number to be called, and I'm waiting for the Salvation Army to take over. And I'm waiting for the meek to be blessed and inherit the earth without taxes. And I'm waiting for forests and animals to reclaim the earth as theirs. And I'm waiting for a way to be devised to destroy all nationalisms without killing anybody. And I'm waiting for linnets and planets to fall like rain. And I'm waiting for lovers and weepers to lie down together again in a new rebirth of wonder. I'm waiting for the day that maketh all things clear. And I'm waiting for retribution for what America did to Tom Sawyer. And I'm waiting for Alice in Wonderland to retransmit me her total dream of innocence. And I'm waiting for Child Roland to come to the final darkest tower. And I'm waiting for Aphrodite to grow live arms at a final disarmament conference and a new rebirth of wonder. And I'm waiting for some strains of unpremeditated art to shake my typewriter. And I'm waiting to write the great indelible poem. And I'm waiting for the last long caress of rapture. And I'm perpetually waiting for the fleeing lovers on the Grecian urn to catch each other at last and embrace. And I'm waiting perpetually and forever on a renaissance of wonder. Thank you for letting me share with you tonight. Thank you, John, for elevating this beyond just another Blur's Day. Uh, Wow. Uh, what a, thank you, John. What an incredible uh, introduction to the way that you approach and see these, see what's going on, the way you filter through stories, the way your insights and perspective uh, is channeled through these narrative uh, structures of meaning is, it's inspiring just to see how you do it. And, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to dig into, and there are so many things, and actually finding a question to start with is, uh, uh, now all of a sudden I know what the challenges of the normal first responder. Um, but I, I think uh, what I'd like to what I'd like to say uh, is um, uh, you remind me of Eve in uh, Paradise Lost. She sees herself in a in a reflecting pool is the first time she sees herself, and then later she will eat the apple, and this will be the symbol of her own self realization. And the, this, this image of the woman seeing herself in a reflection as the moment of self-realization is not uncommon. And it's almost hilarious to see it right here with our iPhone apples, our Apple mirrors, uh, through which we're, we're seeing ourselves. And I, I think you really encourage us to remember that we, uh, we aren't just eating, we are what we eat. And if we can cultivate what we reflect back at ourselves, we'll be, we'll be adjusting who we are and what the world might be. And to just accept a passive one-way reception of the imagery is, uh, is to accept you know, a world that may not be the world of wonder that we truly want. So I, I hope everybody does um, participate in their own reflections with a sense of wonder and growth and a desire and pursuit of newness. And I've, I've got to say, I feel what you're saying in my bones. I, I before in January, uh, December 31st, December 30th, when I realized really all of a sudden that it's gonna be a new decade, something unhinged in me. Like, oh my God, 
it's going to be the new decade. And, and that's before coronavirus said it was going to be a whole new world. I, I just started to feel it, and I think many of us have, and I know many of us feel this very strong uh, readiness for something new. Because that's what I wanted even before this all came up, just like, how about something new? You know, and, and what I think many of us have come to see is that there have been quantum leaps forward already with what's going on. And I think that many of us do want that wonder you're talking about. And one of the things I've been focused on is how Tolkien talks about how fairy tales are relegated to the nursery where they're going to be beat up. And Breton talks about how, you know, art and thought are trapped in cages of logic. And, you know, God is dead and Jefferson cut all the miracles out of the Bible and comic books are for kids. But that's not where we are anymore. Now, now we see these gargantuan imaginal films are what we love the most or what the audiences respond to uh, most significantly. So my question to you, John, is if you think that this rebirth of wonder uh, for which uh, that I, I think we all hope for, do you think it's been gestating since before? all this started before the coronavirus? Yeah, I, I really do. And I, I believe that, um, I believe we've been longing for something that we haven't been able to articulate. And, and even, you know, though I, I put the word wonder uh, to, it, to it, it still doesn't feel completely, um, it doesn't feel like it completely encapsulates the, the idea and the feeling for what we're we're thirsting for and what we're hungering for, and um, I, I think maybe that's the point. I, I, I think if we we found um, the the precise words for it, it would not um, it would not be uh, what we're looking for. And yeah. I also believe that you're you're exactly right that this is something that has been growing and gestating for a long time. Um, we've grown so accustomed to um, our, our world working like uh, the flip of a light switch and, and everything being completely on demand and being um, um, something that we have access to uh, immediately that our every desire is able to be fulfilled. Uh, we, we walk around with this, you know, genie in a bottle um, constantly uh, rubbing it, demanding that the genie go and uh, fulfill our every wish. And I think we're we're hungering for something that doesn't work like that. We've 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 grown tired uh, of, um, of of what we can have in the, uh, the the instant. And if this was something that just showed up or this this hunger uh, just just burst onto the scene, I, I don't think it would be nearly as meaningful as something that's been uh, exp that we've we've seen in the groundswell uh, for such a long time. Thank you. Uh, and I, and I want to, you know, go ahead and welcome in the panel, uh, and especially Dennis, who you uh, evoked uh, in your own talk. I, I wonder if Dennis has something to start with. And then, you know, from there, I, I'm not going to, I'll try and moderate as little as possible. Yeah, thank you for that. And John, and just to share with all of you, I, I worked for a little more than four years on a book uh, uh, implicating Homer's Odyssey. And uh, I titled it From War to Wonder, Recovering Your Personal Myth Through Homer's Odyssey, and published it um, last December. And John, part of the title uh, came out of memories of your and my conversations um, uh, in the myth program. And carrying that into rereading um, the Odyssey, the word wonder, I mean, I was using Albert Cook's translation, somebody else might have done something differently, um, was peppered throughout the work. And so it seems that that title maybe implicated this connection, a bridge and a movement from warring which is implicating all kinds of conflicts to the nature of wonder that allows us to step out of that um, tension and a kind of an abrasiveness uh, with the world. The other thing that I'll, I'll share, and then I'll uh, 
defer to all, all, all the, the rest of you. This morning, something happened to me that you pushed back into my consciousness by analogy. And I'm not sure what the nature of the analogy is, but here's what happened. So Sandy and I have our rituals in the morning, and I take one of my ritual uh, tasks is to feed the cat. So I got her bowl, and I cleaned it out and put the food in it and took it into the room where she eats. And I just happened, after I set it down, to look out the back uh, door to our deck, and we're on a five-and-a-half-acre uh, lot, and I saw something swinging from one of the trees about 40 yards back. And I couldn't understand or comprehend what I was witnessing. So I called Sandy and I said, will you look at that? And there was no breeze. And this was about quarter to seven this morning. And it kept swaying and then it would jerk and then it would sway again. So she, being more on top of things than I am, went into my study and got a pair of binoculars and said, why don't you just bring it in? And so I did, and I saw that it was a bird, a small bird, but I couldn't understand its flight pattern. It was back and forth. So I walked out to it, and I saw this monstrous spider web. And this small bird had gotten itself snagged in it. So I went back into the room and I got a broom and I came back out and I essentially destroyed the spider web and the bird dropped to the ground, chirped. It couldn't fly, but it was fine. It, and I think it had some of the webbing still sticky on its wings. And then it just headed into the bush. Now, this whole business that you brought up, which is so rich about being at home, um, being at home allowed me to <laughs> maybe, maybe interrupt nature and the natural order of things, but I was not going to let that bird be taken in by the spider, and it was going to die if it stayed into, in uh, that web. And I'm thinking now, maybe I witnessed that this morning, to be able to tell you all that story. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. So John, I want to thank you for an absolutely incredible presentation. Um, I, I, as a psychologist, I wanted to tell you that the incubation aspect of uh, that we're all going through has really facilitated the psychological processes and people desiring to connect to their soul. And I, I'm kind of blown away and I'm gonna give you three clinical examples. Um, I have a client in the 20s who smokes weed every day, eight times a day. I can't, couldn't do anything about it. He is creative, and we've been really pushing that, that piece. And he came to me and said, it's time. It's time. Mm. The second one, um, this is another creative client um, in, a, in, in the music uh, field. Uh, she's in her 30s. Uh, you know, there was something going on. I couldn't figure it out. I wasn't sure. Yesterday, she admitted that she's bulimic. Mm. And I've been seeing her for a year. And the only mm. reason that, that she admitted that is because she had the time, the incubation process. And it is that helps, the, helps us all, not only my clients, to come home, um, but it helped her to come home. And the third one, who is someone who's 88 years old, who has engaged and become an activist in a way that's blowing me away, like any archetype that I thought an 88-year-old woman could possibly be, but calling Gavin Newsom's office, calling the LA Times, making the, uh, uh, the assisted living 
uh, place that she was in wear masks. She mm. did this 88, God, I mean, did everything. I'm in wonder. And I'm also, one thing I, I did talk about, not here, but uh, the wonder of virtual reality. It's presenting me with an authenticity in my patients that I cannot believe. And sometimes it's pajama therapy. And it's that, it's that real, it's that close to home, it's that authentic. There's no mask that they need. I am blown away. I'm in a sense of wonder in my practice. It's super cool. Don't you think then that this is one of the after effects of the world that we're going to come back to after the coronavirus has run its course, assuming that even if we learn how to coexist with it, because it has revealed aspects of our world that make the world work better. And, and this may be a difficulty for us to accept, but there are things that we are encountering as a result of being cloistered in our own homes that we would have never discovered on our own because we're just so driven by extroversion and activities and doing. One of the things that I think we need to come up with that the solution is not more doing, it's a state of being. We need to figure out how to be. And this is compelling us inward to enter this kind of liminal space that we are in and not be too quick to get out. You know, let's, let's let the movie run for a little while longer because it is writing a narrative right. for us right now. And we better learn something about who we are and what we are rather than being so quick to plug back into any kind of activity that we think is a defining moment for us. I wonder when we'll be ready or what ready will be if there will be a ready. I feel ready. I'm, I'm ready. Uh, to move forward with 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 a new self and and what I've gone through and gone in and, and I'm ready to come out. Uh, I've done a lot of going in. I might have I started for my own reasons maybe a month earlier than than this whole thing. But you know I, I agree that we don't want to come out too early before we're finished. You know baking. Um, John, do you have any thoughts about when we're going to be ready or what ready is going to look like? You know. I don't know if we're ever going to necessarily get to a place that we say we're ready. You know, I, I think there's, um, if we've really learned the lessons of this time, my, my hope is that we, we wouldn't um, say that, that we would uh, say um, we're, we're going to step out into this. And we, you know, there, there, there's, there's something about, um, and please don't take this the wrong way. I, I I want us to all be safe, and I want us to. I don't. I, let's listen to science, you know, on this. I'm I'm a big science person, um, but at some point, uh, when science is said it's okay, I predict there's still going to be a lot of um, fear mongering and a lot of um, uh, people that uh, come up with all new conspiracy theories, you know, about a lot of things. And I, I think at some point, every person is going to have to find it within themselves uh, to say, okay, um, I'm going to take this, this step of, of stepping out and re-engaging life again. And that's what I'm most interested in is, is people um, finding it within themselves, the, uh, that piece to, to step out and say, I'm going to, um, I'm going to step out into this again. The science, you know, says it's safe to do so. And um, now it's time for me to re-engage my life, you know, in a new way. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that, um, I think we all would love for someone to, to, to tell us, okay, we're ready. You know, we're, we're all looking for that pie mander to, to step up and, you know, give the, give the word. Um, but I, I hope we're listening within ourselves Again, once the science has said it's okay, I hope we're listening within ourselves and that we've, we've come to a place to, 
uh, that we can um, have the confidence within ourselves to say, okay, uh, now it's time for me to, to step out and I'm deciding to do this. Zaman. Um, well, much has been said about time and time is sitting quiet here. Zaman means time in case some of you didn't know. Um, it's an old uh, Assyrian word for, uh, a, for a time when time was God. And uh, religion, uh, a pre-Zoroastrian religion in the name of Zarwanism was uh, like uh, uh, the worship of time, the understanding of time. And since time was measured by sun, and then we went to sun worshiping and all the rest, which uh, need not be said because we all know that. But um, I, I think that uh, oftentimes when we look at a thing as a problem, it is probably a kind of a coordination or our expectations as to how to coordinate the timing of things. Somehow, um, we are thinking too much uh, in linear time. And when we look at nature, um, nature knows its own time and it's not in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And things uh, get resolved. Um, <clears throat> problems take care of themselves. Um, perhaps there is something in, in our human nature that when our sense of timing is out of whack with the timing of the time itself, father time, nature, uh, chronos. When that is out of whack, we see in it a kind of problem. We either want to speed up things or slow them down because we consider ourselves as the standard rather than trying to match our own expectations with the natural flow of time. Um, and I think it could be in that context where when we look at things and try to reason them, the word for reasoning in Arabic is aql, and aql and that uh, turban-shaped uh, rope that uh, the Arabs put on, around their head, they are both pronounced the same. They have the same derivative. Uh, one is called aqala, the other one is called aql. In a sense, there is a, a reasoning within you, within your head, and then there is a reasoning around your head that, that is looping us. So, uh, and, and what does reasoning require? Uh, again, the word is even spelled, uh, you know, like, like a, a pictograph. It's spelled like a knot, the word for uh, reason. In Arabic, it's spelled like a knot. And the knot implies that there are two variables, and the only way you understand them is to tie them together, to create a knot, to establish a cause and effect, how one leads to another. So it's through the cause we understand the effect or it's through effect, effects where we understand what the cause is. Now, um, if we are talking about something called the coronavirus, uh, where does that word come from? Corona comes from the crown. The crown is what you put around your head, and that's what ties it back to the reasoning part of it, through your intellectual reasoning. So uh, I think there is something else that goes with it. The reasoning that I'm talking about in the Islamic culture comes through the Quran, and the Quran is a revelation. And so what revelation, what does the symbol or symbolism of revelation um, involve in what we are doing now. What's the opposite of that which is revealed? Is that which is covered, sealed, masked. So we mask ourselves so we wouldn't get the coronavirus. Um, do I make the connections clear there? Without implying the value element to it, whether it's good or bad, I think there is a whole lot of symbolism in these events. And this, these events, as, as John put it rightly, it, it take us to a level of wonder. And uh, oftentimes when people ask me, how am I doing with, uh, with the lockdown and the whole thing, uh, I 
tell them the truth. I said, I've been doing it for the last six years. I live in the mountains all by myself and with my beautiful cat, uh, my very beautiful cat. Uh, and and uh, nothing bothers me. I mean, for me, things have not changed. Uh, the only things that have changed is that I used to be zooming up and down the freeways. Now I'm zooming, zooming up and down the Zoom, I guess. Um, so I, I think uh, if we can put those things together that nature will do its thing because it has uh, the, what, the, the control, I don't know, that word doesn't sound right, because it knows time. And if we assume time as linear, it knows the speed of time. And it is not in a hurry, uh, or, or nor, nor is it doing the opposite of, you know, uh, slowing down. So uh, I, I think if we adjust ourselves without worrying as to you know, when, is, when are we ready to reopen the economy or, you know, how long, we, you know, all of these things have to do with our time not being in sync with the real time. And that will, if and when that happens, that syncing could create its own synchronicity. Um, that, that, that's my two cents worth. There have been a couple questions that have come in from the, I'll call it the gallery, from what a high quality audience we do have. John, how would you characterize the relationship of curiosity to wonder? Um, I think it's a beautiful question. Um, and I would also add to the audience, if you have a question, if you'd submit it to that, rather than us going back and forth and getting in that, if you think it's a coherent question that can be put in a few words and you don't mind my rephrasing it and talking to whomever, uh, if you would just write it and we'll see either Will and I will bring it into the discussion. John? Yeah, I, um, curiosity has become one of my favorite topics this last year um, in, in this research, you know, around wonder. And um, the, the more that I, I look at wonder, there is a real relationship, in my opinion, between curiosity um, and wonder. I, I think in many ways, curiosity is a gateway to wonder. It is a door to wonder. Um, I, I notice <laughs> that my life has become so much richer when I have followed my curiosity about things that um, I'm the only one in the world that seems to care about it. So th this is an odd example, but I have become fascinated by this dime museum that existed in New York City called Hubert's Dime Museum. And it, uh, it closed in 1969, but it was in Times Square for a number of years. And I have, there's something about that place, I, even though it, it, um, it closed before I was ever even born, but there's something about that place that I have just went down the rabbit hole on and followed my curiosity to the nth degree in learning about Hubert's. And I, the lesson that I, I've learned in the relationship between curiosity and wonder with Hubert's Dime Museum has been, I don't know even that it matters that much what it is that we're curious about. It's the following of the curiosity all the way to the end that seems to lead to wonder. I, I think I'm probably the only person in the world that is this curious about Hubert's Dime Museum, but it's led me to such places of wonder. And I think we often uh, judge what we're curious about uh, through this lens of time and saying, oh, I don't have time to be really curious about that. We're as curious as one Google search will allow us to be. And, and that is unfortunate because we, we, uh, we're stalled on the path to wonder. So that relationship to me is, it's the doorway, it's, it's the entry point, but we've got to take it all the way if we really want to find the wonder and curiosity. Yeah. May I add just a real quick footnote to John's? 
I have been reading this. I don't know if you can see it. It's entitled uh, Curiosity, and it's by Alberto Mangel, M-A-N-G-U-E-L. And he uses Dante's Divine Comedy as his foundation for exploring curiosity. And I, it's just a fabulous journey uh, following Alberto with his curiosity, which then arouses ours, the reader. So I want you all to know about its existence. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, um, and I just wanted to, to add that I think that one of the key elements of curiosity is uncertainty. And so I think that you, you, we've had a kind of growing of the collective imagination towards a more imaginal sensibility away from hyper-realism, a kind of enlightenment hangover. Uh, and as we've, our imaginations have grown, now all of a sudden it's thrust into extreme uncertainty. And you mix that imagination with uncertainty. And John, I know you're a Star Wars fan. And I think one of my favorite moments in movies, because it's not even that great of a moment, but it, the moment that Snoke is killed and the second to last movie, because I had no idea, immediately in that moment, I had no idea where we were going. And that was such a good feeling to just not know where we're going. And I think that kind of, some of us feel a special happy relief that, you know what, to break some of the old momentum is, is kind of nice. And, um, and I know I want us to hear from, uh, from Voris and Selena and Elizabeth some more before, uh, before we shift totally to questions. So. Um, so I hope we'll, yeah, please let's, let's do, I see Boris is unmuted, so hopefully he's got something for us. Thanks, well, I appreciate that. Uh, first, I wanted to say to John, my question is for you. Uh, I really appreciate it and was moved by your presentation. And I was moved by it because it was beautiful, but not in the, beautiful, but not in the sentimental sense. It's beautiful because while you were reading poetry and these stories, I was, reintroduced the both not my own wonder but also my own terror and it was just really wonderful how you did that occupied that space of, of, of contradiction and that leads me to to my question um, last week one of the panelists talked about how we should be able to reside with darkness right before we get to this other place. And I think Dana also kind of referred to this earlier, right? The, the notion, my question, you would be not one this relationship to um, curiosity, but one this relationship to darkness. And, and what I mean by that, right, is not in a negative way, but previously there's been a lot of discussion of the emergence of the feminine. And it makes me think of Persephone and the dark feminine, right? Where you have both, she is the goddess of transformation, where she's both the goddess of the underworld and the goddess of spring, right? And that makes me think of this term the Greeks use called pharmacon, that in any situation, there's both cure and poison. So with that as a kind of context, could you talk about, um, the darkness in the feminine as it relates to wonder. Uh, Voris, you're, you're really uh, opening up one of my favorite topics in the world. So thank and you uh, for that. I just want to bring in as you respond, John, that the pomegranate started popping this week. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Sorry, um, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, uh, the idea of, um, I, I love that you bring up uh, Persephone because Honestly, what got me, I, I mentioned a moment ago about this um, uh, dime museum in, in Times Square, this very dark uh, place. Uh, Times Square was not Disney friendly back in the 60s and 50s when you know this place existed. And what got me interested in it was uh, Deanne Arbus, the famous photographer, went and took photos there. And that was my first introduction to Hubert's Dime Museum. And when I found out the story of Deanne Arbus going to um, Hubert's Dime Museum from her very wealthy loft uptown in Manhattan, um, I couldn't help but think this is the story of feminine descent into the underworld. And you know, th this is playing out in this really fascinating story. And I 
I, the underworld may be my most favorite uh, uh, topic in all of mythology. Um, I, I, uh, when I was at Pacifica, Lance taught a, a course on the underworld that just changed my life, just rocked my world. And um, I, I find myself, even in new cities, when I go and visit, if I get asked to come and speak, I often, the night before I speak, will drive around that city looking for the seediest, most dark part of that city um, because there's something within me that connects uh, my curiosity about darkness and um, wonder. Often, um, you know, what the, the story I told earlier about um, uh, the, the, the king who went to the other land with the snake and, you know, uh, was brought, brought back the magic mirror, one thing I didn't go into detail on is when the snake takes that man uh, to his kingdom, he takes him down through a dark, dark hole to go through that kingdom. And I, I think that passageway to wonder is often a very dark passage. And I, I think, you know, we, we often... Um, we often go one of two two ways when it comes to this darkness. We avoid it completely, and we have this very you know dualistic approach to to darkness and light, or we romanticize the darkness. And I think equally uh, both are equally problematic. Um, I I have a lot of dear friends that insist on romanticizing the darkness to an unhealthy degree. And again, I think finding that that balance between um, the, the healthy and the unhealthy when it comes to uh, the, the dark path to wonder, um, that's the real key to me. I, I love that topic, love that question. Would uh, you say, John, that the, in the darkness, we are possessed with the lens to see all of the various aspects of ourselves, as well as the cosmos, and that it takes a different sort of illumination to bring these things forth. And that that's one of the purposes that the darkness serves is a way to allow us to see things that the light obscures. Uh, much like when Dennis came on and his window was bright, I couldn't see him, but it blocked him out. Now that he's illuminated against the dark background, everything about him comes through. And, and I think the darkness may hold treasures for us that, that we often overlook. Would you speak to something like that? Absolutely. I, I, am, a, um, I am a person that is interested uh, in that darkness. Um, and I'm interested in, in finding ways to speak about and to present that darkness in a way that is inviting to people in a healthy way, uh, which I, I think it can be a real challenge to do. Often I think when we invite people into that darkness, uh, we can easily appeal to uh, the, the lesser angels of their good nature. Um, but I also think that, um, that there is a healthy path into that darkness. And um, I, I think the, the real preparation um, for entering that darkness, you know, is, is that mirror we talked about. It, it is being able to look in that mirror and that sort of self-reflection to be able to see, um, is, is this a space that is uh, opened, uh, opened up to where I am, you know, right now, which I think is very important. I also saw uh, Elizabeth raise her hand. Hi, Elizabeth. It's so good to have you on the panel. And I, I'm, oh, I admire her work so much. I'm really anxious to hear uh, her thoughts or, or questions or whatever she would have. So I, I'm going to throw it over to Elizabeth. I really would love to, uh, to hear from her. Thank you so much, John. And, and congratulations on just a brilliant presentation, full of energy. And Voris, thank you very much for turning this conversation in a darker way, because that's exactly what I've been thinking all along. Um, you know, with, with a topic like this, when, when the word wonder comes into the conversation, um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of a bullions to it, there's a sense of a possibility and, and 
there's a kind of a sizzle and a sparkle and a snap and I just immediately recoil because one of the things I think is most important to remember at this time is what I will refer to as Hillman's pathologizing eye. We need to remember the pathologizing aspect of the coronavirus and all of our experiences with it. And these, this is absolutely an invitation into the dark, into the unknown, uh, into chaos, into pain and suffering and degradation, uh, into loss. Sorry if I'm being a downer in the conversation, but, but these, are, these are all of the things that um, we're being presented with. Um, and the only thing, I have a couple of things to say about that, but um, I, I was, I think if I'm gonna be you know, true to the archetypal perspective, I would say we need to be true to, to this deep, dark path. And it is the path of the feminine. It is where we see you know, feminine powers, earthly powers, phonic powers uh, in more of our mythologies. So I, I, I see the, 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 the coronavirus as, um, as a resurgence of the dark feminine that has been abused for at least 5,000 years. And one of the things that I want to mention is that I think in this place, at least one of the stories that I revere, uh, the story of Anana's descent into the underworld, um, insight and seeing have nothing to do with it. That it's her hearing, it's her hearing that allows her to descend. And even as she descends, she's mistaken about what the descent involves. She thinks she can march into the underworld, into the great below with all of her regalia, all of her powers. And guess what? She, she cannot. So this stripping process that Inanna goes through in the myth, I think, is another story that we need to remember at this time. We're being stripped. We're being stripped. And so... so Anyway, I would love to hear you comment on that. And then one other question that may have something to do with this. Um, I love what you were saying about home and being called home. But I think there's a very important distinction between being at home, being in place, and being in a location. And I'm well aware of the fact that many people who are sheltering at home or sheltering in place, in fact, are living very desperate lives, more endangered than they once were. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, so, so I, wow, great questions. <laughs> um, I, I think I want to, to uh, talk about that, that last thing you, you mentioned there first. Um, that's been on my mind a lot. Uh, those who, uh, this return home has been a, a danger to their, their physical self, those who, for who this return home has meant uh, the lack of certainty about meals, uh, those who this return home has meant a lack of um, um, anyone engaging with them during the day uh, that is, is not um, an electronic uh, device. And um, you know, I, I mentioned um, uh, David Foster Wallace uh, in my presentation, who, you know, is, is someone who unfortunately took his own life. And he had a lot to say about our relationship between um, home and love and technology. And he, he said something to the effect that we basically look for, um, we look for all these, um, uh, things that don't love us to meet our basic needs and um, that it, it, it's causing uh, a crippling effect within us. And I, I think we, we've developed such as, an, as a society that a parent can leave someone who really shouldn't be left alone at home all day, uh, a, a spouse, you know, that's maybe an abusive relationship, um, you know, is, is forced to return and spend uh, all this time at home. Um, and, and that home 
that we, we talk about in the, the best archetypal sense of the word um, also can be that, that place of darkness. It, it actually can be that, um, that, that space uh, that, that moves us away from health and wholeness. And you know that, that's where that's where I think it's hard to talk about um, the, these ideas at all with with large generalities because we we're we're forced to to go into the nuances you know and say this is um, this is an idea that applies much of the time in these current circumstances but uh, for for so many you know this this is empty and that that speaks to the grand diversity of, of the world that we live in. And, um, you know, I've, I've tried to really be very cautious to, to move towards the, the first part of the question, you know, that you uh, were asking. I, I really tried to be very aware of who I've been listening to during this time and what sort of um, um, advice and those who would want to even lead me towards uh, dark exploration. Um, what, what's the motivation? What's the intention? What are we What are we trying to 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 do here? Um, and, and I that concerns me. It concerns me a great deal. Um, and yet, at the same time, I think one of the greatest tools we have as human beings is our conversations with each other. I, I think the wisdom that arises from a collective conversation like the one we're having now is so much more meaningful to me than what any one wise person might say. And I, I think this format of having a panel that, that really engages the, the topic the presenter brings up, it's really important because otherwise, you know, what? who am I? What do, what do I have to, to offer during the midst of this time? It becomes valuable when we as, as a group can begin to um, build up this idea into to to pull the wisdom out uh, as a group, which I think is one of the grandest lessons that we're taking from um, this time is how much we we truly need each other in the midst of this just to to find the path through the path through may go through darkness, but we're going to need um, others. And my hope is uh, that some some of you who are, are listening to this right now, who maybe are a little further up the path than me, can have a flashlight and shine it and say, John, up here, I'm a little further up, and I can see where you're at and get a little further up uh, the path, and then someone else is a little further up, and they'll shine their flashlight and say, I'm over here, I'm a little further up, and, and we, can, we can make it up this mountain together through the dark times. You know, I, I think that that is the exact perfect segue into inviting in a larger group uh, to join us on this run. Um, uh, Dana, do you want to uh, reach out or invite in some of the why, audience? Why don't, if you want, raise your hand, I will call on you. In the meantime, um, we had at a previous Myth Salon a fellow named Michael Gellert. And you know, one of his books is very small. It's called The Way of the Small. And I'm struck by how small moments, the, uh, the bird in the spider web that Dennis talked about. If, if you blow by that, nothing happens. The bird dies, life goes on. He goes back in, breakfast, goes for a, wife with a, goes for a walk with his wife, Sandy. One time, I was at Pacifica listening to a fellow very much like you, and I came away with a pearl. I don't know if you remember having a pearl out there. <laughs> and I was struck by how small things need to be worked on and chewed and gestated and not let out of focus. And sometimes the big picture can get in the way, the significant. But what about the insignificant? What about the disenfranchised, the people that we often walk by and don't see? Because as we've come to realize there's a structural engineering in our culture that really affects people disproportionately. The, this doesn't affect us all. 
if you can and you can afford it, you separate. But what if you can't afford it? What if, what if you can't, uh, what if your life doesn't work that way? And the people who are on the front lines and still clamoring for work and survival, they don't have the same luxuries that many of us have who have pulled back, analyzed it, felt it differently, allowed ourselves to trust and to do the things. But it takes trust to trust. You can't just say, oh, I'm not going to be afraid and all that. So I'm struck by the small, insignificant, seemingly passing somebody. And I'm trying to see people's eyes and feel if they're smiling behind their masks and, and, and develop a way to, to comprehend and to come out of this okay. So that my, my sense of dealing with one another doesn't get, isn't, isn't becoming a casualty. In, in this period. So let's throw it open to people in the audience. If anybody wants to say anything, there's a hand. Um, I'm going to work with this. I'm allowing you to talk. Um, go ahead. Um, hello. Hello, Shalom. Is I, am I saying your name right? Shalom? Shalom, correct. Shalom. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Dana. Welcome. Thanks for the mic. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted less of a question and more of a comment just along the lines of um, what the beautiful woman was speaking to around the anonymous and just thinking about this idea of like, where are we going as opposed to how are we relating? And, um, you know, what turns um, Anana's the, the pivot in Anana's path comes when Hiresher girl, when the dark, dark goddess is attuned to, and when she's listened to, and when her moans are echoed. And I just don't want us to skip over that piece right now. I just feel like it's so important for us to collectively relate to each other in that way and to the earth in that way. And, um, and, and from that place of listening and attuning and being relational, um, we'll discover a new way. So, thanks. Great comment, Shalom. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. um, unless we can be really attuned to the cries, we're not, we're not being true to this experience. You know, I'll, I'll just comment on that. I've, I've uh, been in some situations where I've gotten to listen to a number of money managers talk about what's going on. And uh, on no uncertain terms, you know, the question of how well the economy is going to do and how well the working individual is going to do are separate issues at this point. And the people that are managing the money and the people that are concerned with the success of the economy it is at this point a divorced question from how well the individual and the worker is going to do. And so I think uh, that's exactly to your, to your point, Elizabeth, is that there is unfortunately a path forward where we just ignore that, or at least there's a, a seeming illusion of a path. And um, so I think that, you know, it, it, we may have to, it may be more than necessity. We may have to actually choose with the real choice to do the right thing. Zaman? Um, I think there is uh, a way to tie back the concept of the, the darkness and the home, uh, which is our first home, the womb, where we were born, conceived. Um, and I, I think the darkness implies that we are going back to the womb. The way things were going on, like it was uh, said earlier, there were many things that were basically uh, not the way they were supposed to be. So we are going back to the darkness, to the womb, for a rebirthing of a new concept or whatever comes out of this. And, and the way this ties with the concept of uh, curiosity and wonder, uh, 
is like I said earlier, if we allow nature to use its own uh, time uh, for revealing things to us, it surprises. And those surprises are wonders. Those are, they are beautiful because they happen in terms that the nature, the flow of time on the natural terms have decided. However, when we humans, again, uh, somehow become responsible for missing that coordination, and we want the time to go at the speed that we want. So what is curiosity? Curiosity is when we don't allow nature to do things in its own time, but in rather in our time, we want things to speed up. We want to you know, knock on the door, find out what's going on. So when we become curious in that way, we create an expectation because we are thinking we are in charge. Once you create an expectation, there is no way you can have wonder because the expectation is in a way, whether it happens or not. That's beautiful. Yeah, you have prepared yourself for it. So in many cases, we deny ourselves that sense of wonder because we want to control time. We don't want time to do its thing in its own term. And I think this uh, uh, darkness that we are in now is uh, in a way taking us back to reconceive that because uh, <clears throat> again, if I go to the Arabic language, the birthing from the darkness came through Layl, which means the night. And then uh, from that comes Layla, the first archetypal, the first woman that give birth to things. So Layl and Layla, the darkness, both as the womb, the feminine, uh, uh, we, we talked about here, uh, uh, the dark feminine, uh, as well as the birthing element of it. Um, but uh, we often ruin it for ourselves because we don't allow to be surprised by nature through a sense of wonder. The folly of adulthood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a question from Michelle Coletti. Um, would you like to address one of the panel? Well, um, hi, everybody. Uh, although you can't see me, I see that. Um, so uh, I have a request actually for Elizabeth that I think it would be so wonderful if you could you put together a presentation about the dark feminine and the coronavirus? Because I, I do think that would be really helpful at this time. I like I, I agree. I, I see like when we were talking about darkness, you know, uh, the underworld is the place for transformation. Seeds are in the earth, which is darkness. Um, the the caterpillar is in the chrysalis and the cocoon. There's dark in there. So I think we just lost Michelle somehow. Oh, there you are. You're back again. Yeah, Michelle? I'm not doing this right. I'm sorry. Anyway, the short answer is yes, Michelle. I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. There you are. <laughs> oh, I'm unmuting her now. There you are. Oh. No. So, yes. Yay, Elizabeth, thank you. Um, and I, and I think, I also think uh, our minds just get so caught up in like the day-to-day -day stuff that when we can integrate our, our, our lower selves, our minds, our egos, whatever you want to call it, into a larger perspective, whether it's a mythic perspective or a higher self, however you want to call it, um, that, that gives us the ability to kind of have deeper meaning for me and, and put things in a perspective. And like a lot of times the eagle doesn't want to do this easily. It's going to go kicking and screaming. So with the Inanna Arishka Gil myth, like it's, it's both. Like, I don't think it's not easy to do, to do that configuration without a certain amount of like inner struggle or uh, upset or just, you know, being pissed off about something. So I, I just think all of it's important. And, and you know, that when we have those hissy fits, that the voice comes in to console us and give us compassion for those, you know, little tantrums that we're throwing. 
that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. I think uh, um, one, I'll just make one comment about Please. the in Inanna story that I think is so important to remember is that she's not only queen of heaven and earth, but she is a genuine strategist. And so she asks her warrior woman, yeah. Yeah. to basically wait at the edge of the great below for her. And if she doesn't return within three days, right. you have to go get help. So this is strategic thinking um, that I, so I think, I think at a time like this, we may be, we are in this, this terrible underworld, but there is another archetypal figure who represents a, a kind of a, 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 a conscious uh, st strategist, a warrior woman who wants us to survive. And I'd like to remember that aspect of the story too. There are many interesting aspects. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, I think I see Darla. Yeah, we have Darla. Hang on one second. Let's get you in here. Hi there. Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Let's see if I can figure out how to bring you in here. There we go. Did I do it? Oh, you did the opposite. There you go. She, she'd have to click video, I believe, herself. Um, you know, I'm not doing this very well. I'm going to stop doing that. Sorry. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, no video at the moment, but can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I wanted to comment, first of all, that the experience of listening to John was a, a wonderful one for me because I, it brought tears. And I use that word wonderful in the sense that it wasn't really the wonder that I stuck, stuck with. It was the longing part of it. I really felt like the listening to that gave me the safe space to really feel that longing you know to the point where it was just like a physical experience of it and i'm also having as a takeaway some of the things that we talked about in terms of patience you know and that um even in listening to what elizabeth is saying about the pathologizing part of it that there is a need to stay with the longing for a little bit longer mm -hmm. you know and recognizing that we that that wonder is something that that we'd like to be evoked but not jumping it to it quite so quickly to stay really with that longing and allowing it and listening to it and and being with it because there's something very alive in that for me and the jumping too quickly is less than that so that was only my comment, and uh, and I just wondered if you if anybody had a reaction or a thought about that part of it. Yeah, I I do that um, that really resonates with me. Um, th this longing that I've been feeling, um, I talk about it in such different ways depending on the day of the week it is, and I feel like again I, I keep circling around it, um, but it. It just, I, I can't quite find ways to articulate it. Um, I, I feel it, and I feel it in others, and I feel it in the conversations that, um, that, that I have with others. And I, and I even feel it just in the conversation in this uh, video room, you know, in the, the way that we're all gathered together. I, I feel it. And... Um, I just want to, you know, I, I don't have uh, answers as, so much as I just want to affirm that longing and say um, there, there's something that I think a great number of people are, are feeling that longing and having trouble finding ways to talk about it. Um, but we, um, I, I, I find I'm closest to it um, when I engage art and, and music and poetry and those things make me feel closer to it um, because I'm feeling it and not so much talking about it. We certainly are seeing that in the uh, work of our artists right now because conspiracy or not, I don't believe every artist out there who's made work that's suddenly all of a sudden relevant was in on a conspiracy. 
Uh, and it is stunning and staggering. I think many of you probably see the same thing. And any of you who are doing your own work, you look down and you realize, oh my God, I was writing about this just before it happened too. And I bet, I bet there are multiple people on this panel that all of a sudden are looking down and saying, oh my gosh. And that goes back to what Zaman was saying about uh, being out of sync with time. And, uh, you know, I, I love this idea. Socrates, of course, you had showed us some great masks of Silenus earlier which makes me uh, think of Socrates. And Socrates, of course, points out that, you know, maybe the artists, artists don't even know what they're channeling or, or what's really there, uh, but they are channeling something profound. And, uh, and of course, this was in a platonic dialogue, which was by definition a, a, con a, a relationship between art and, and intellect. And I think uh, it's really special what you've brought in today, John, bringing in stories for us to intellectually reflect upon. Stories whose insights might not have even been presented as insights when they were originally written. And who knows how many stories we're going through right now, which will become parables. But right now, they're just life. Boris, why don't we go to you? I think this notion of longing is vitally important also because longing of course is linked to desire uh, and if you're and in a patriarchal culture desire demands to be relieved immediately and what the dark feminine demands is something different it demands that we hibernate with longing and deal with its complexities and this again takes us back to uh, Elizabeth and this notion of the dark feminine when she talks about listening because this notion of listening is contrary to the Western tradition where we value the visual. We don't value this listening which is indeed deeply feminine in certain kinds of ways and I think the best way that for me to kind of encapsulate that is it's very easy that in this culture it's very it's easier to say you don't believe in God than it is to say you don't believe in profit. And profit is all about the immediate satisfaction of desire. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'd like to invite Charlie Dahlgren in, if, he, if he's willing. Here he is. Let me find him. I'm gonna put him on the spot. He's always good for saying something <laughs> profound. Are you there? Hey, Charlie. Did he come in? Looks like it, but he's muted. There he is. Where is he? I'm, I'm struggling with this thing today, so I'm sorry. Um, and now I've lost him. I don't know where he went. Um, I don't know why you can't hear me. Testing there you are. Yeah. There, there you, you are. Okay. Okay. So here's what I'm, I, I'm sort of curious about. I saw the picture of narcissists go by there in John's presentation, which was so inspiring, John. And I love the poem. Um, the picture of narcissists had me thinking about sort of our, you know, and the poem too, about our sort of Americanness and our rugged individualism and how this has sort of morphed into this, society of narcissists and I, I i don't count myself completely out of that i mean the selfies and the magic in the mirror is in large part because we're taking so many pictures of ourselves so i'm curious what you think in terms of being the culture being able to kind of unglue from that aspect of the magic in the mirror the aspect of sort of this self-obsession and kind of what he was talking about, about it being so visual. Yeah, I, I, um, I've been thinking a lot about this and uh, that, that image that I put in the presentation is very intentional. Um, I believe we are as a society looking in the mirror so much and this selfie culture is about our um, deep, longing for identity. I, I think we don't know who we are and we are, um, we, are we are doing anything in our power to try and um, um, 
establish an identity for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's the, um, you know, the, the musical culture that we're a part of, the sports team that we're a part of, we are, uh, you know, wonderfully so, a, a tribal people that want to uh, be a part of the group and we want to be a part of the tribe. Um, but I, I think we have done that uh, to our own peril because we, we don't know who we are. We, we, we've come to understand tribe much more so than we understand ourselves. And so in some ways, the uh, tribal identity has allowed us to, to not have to do the hard work of knowing who we are. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, our, our selfie culture is very much um, uh, about that deep focus on ourselves. We keep looking at ourselves wondering, who is this person staring back at me? Who is this person um, in this photograph? Who is this person I'm seeing right now looking at it through this video lens? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really think that's at the core of so much of this, you know, whether it's wonder or curiosity or darkness in, in some, so many ways, it's tied up in this identity piece, you know, that we, we are searching for who we are. And the minute we think we may have an idea about it, um, someone else challenges it or we, we change our minds, you know, about it. Now, granted, it's an ongoing process, you know, that's every moment of every day. Um, but I, I feel like um, people don't even have the tools, you know, to, to begin to try and craft some sense of what it means to, to be themselves uh, right now. It's not so much anymore about what we're like, it's about what we like whether that's on Facebook or the type of music we like or the films we like or the TV shows. When you, when you meet someone in our current culture and, and we say, tell me about you, we, we basically tell each other the things we like. Mm -hmm. we, we don't really tell people about us. We, we tell people, these are the things I like in hopes that we may find that some of the things we like are the same things that someone else likes. And um, again, all of this is just a brand avoidance of, of finding out who we are. So to me, this identity piece uh, and that, that image that you, you mentioned in the presentation, um, it, it's very closely connected to all this. Doesn't it, connection. doesn't it seem that our identities are in a perpetual state of dissolving from one state to another and as they're passing by us like images underneath the water in a, in a river, we kind of seize upon one and say, oh, that's me. All right, that's, that's who I want to be. And wait a minute, there it goes. I think I'll catch that one. But the whole notion of fixity is something that we've been raised with, the idea of defining ourselves and picking something and rejecting everything else. Uh, Michelle had a comment in hers about all of the various states of the psyche. And whether it's ego or the deep self or whatever, we have these aspects within ourselves that none of them wants to be eliminated. Everybody wants a seat at the table. Uh, Hillman talks about the polytheism of, this, of the human psyche. And to me, we have to resist that notion of settling on one, of, of finding a way to get rid of all of the other ones, letting the one connect with all the other ones and not letting us be dominated by either the ego or the, or the largest one in the room. Boris? No? I, I did see uh, Dennis unmute and remute and it, uh, okay. you know, at risk of missing out on a real gem, I hope. And then I'm sure we'll, we'll start wrapping up. Yeah, and I'll be, and I'll be brief to respect uh, the God Kronos, who we don't want to anger uh, because we want to keep these um, uh, myth salons moving. But, you know, part of the wisdom of the Narcissus myth, and I'm just tapping into um, Charlie and uh, John, it seems to me that Narcissus gets in trouble when he spurns Echo. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd be a completely different mythic figure had he accepted that echoic part of himself and it's auditory it's not visual 
But when he, so in, in a little bit of writing that I've done on this myth, um, I understand echo as the presence of irony. You know, when you can hear yourself, uh, you can keep a little bit of distance and not get fixated to pull on Dana's term. But when, when the echoic part of the psyche is spurned, I mean, this is one of the first uh, examples of social distancing I think that uh, the West has at its, at, at, at its disposal. When he spurns her, then he moves to the virginal waters uh, to drink, and he's satisfying a longing, or he's satisfying a desire. And when he, when he reaches down to drink from this virginal pond that is so virginal that not even a leaf has ever landed on it, no deer have ever come to the edge uh, to drink. That looming up at him is this other, this stranger. Mm -hmm. And he becomes curious and wonderful about that figure. I understand that when Echo is spurned and Narcissus moves to the edge of the pond, and sees himself mirrored. At first, he doesn't recognize himself. And then upon reflection, he does. My understanding is this is the danger, and I've been hearing the Narcissus myth really weaving its way through the last two hours, which has been wonderful. Self-reflection self dissolves into self-fixation. This is when self-fixation, I think the myth is suggesting, occurs when the sense of the ironic about ourselves that I think echo carries is spurned, is pushed off to the side of the road. So I just wanted to add that, and thank you for letting me uh, speak about it. And John, you, you have to feel so successful because of the conversation that you stirred in us and brought us all to levels of reflection that have just been marvelous. So thank you. Will, why don't you, I'd like to thank the entire panel for today. This has been a, a really beautiful myth salon. John, thank you very much. Um, I would like to pass it to Will. I would like to have it come back to me so that I can ring my singing bell. Um, but Will, would you like to say some parting comments? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say a quick thing and, and ask John if he'd like to add any parting comments as well. Uh, you know, I'll just say um, one of the things, this, this, I find myself learning more about myself and the world and how to give a presentation and just about everything in these events. So thank you everybody and thank you, John. Uh, and one of the things that I've really been focused on lately is the, you know, the return journey as well. I think that's where we are and what we're on. And it just finally clicked for me that the return journey is always, well, we know it's to home, but it's also a birth. And birth is in the home until we take it into the hospital, right? So, so birth, there's something special about the fact that birth and rebirth are into the home. Mm -hmm from the darkness and into the home uh and of course hestia uh her, her words around her name relate to both uh, ishara both uh i think that's the right word uh female genitals and the hearth so they're born from the darkness into the light at the center of the home and uh many people said a lot of things that have helped me continue to to stoke that fire and make more sense of what it is uh, and that ultimately you don't get to return unless uh, unless it's through home. Um, so thank you, everybody, and thank you, John. And, and John, I'd just love to hear if you have any closing thoughts for us as well. Um, I, I just, I'm filled right now uh, with gratitude. Um, I, I've been learning a lot myself during this time of, of quarantine, and one of the things I'm, I'm learning is a new sense of gratitude. Um, things I'd taken for granted so often uh, that I'm now so grateful uh, for and to be able to uh, be here tonight and to
to present uh, to so many people that are here that I deeply admire uh, and to have these conversations. Um, I am just tremendously, tremendously grateful and full of gratitude. So my parting words are, are just thank you. Thank, John. thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, in closing, what I would, what I want to say is that we come from darkness and silence and we return to darkness and silence. Bob Dylan tells us those who are not busy being born are busy dying. So here we go. I want to thank everybody for attending another Myth Salon. We'll keep you posted. These are beautiful, beautiful experiences for me and they would not be possible in this format without the shadow of the coronavirus pandemic looming over us. I'm just, I'm touched by what, how we have responded. And I think when the whole thing is said and done, we will have our salons to look back on and say, well, this is how we spent our time. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Bless your evening. Thank you. Take care, Take everyone. And will. Be safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Good, Good night, everyone. See you next time. See you next time. See you next time. Good job, Don. Love everyone.